monetizing digital services since 2004, boosting the entertainment industry by making digital content accessible for everyone. AWG, where innovation meets monetization. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. You enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Dr. Aaron Ahuvia about CSR and creating a brand people love. Dr. Aaron Ahuvia, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. John, thank you. It is a pleasure to be with you today. You're joining us from Michigan. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about creating brands that people love and connecting that to corporate social responsibility efforts and ethical dimensions of branding. Uh, I also thought it'd be kind of interesting if we can build this into employer branding uh, and what companies can do to build their employer brand and be an employer of choice. So these are some of the things that we'll be exploring and discussing together today. As we get started, I wanted to share Aaron's bio with everybody. Dr. Aaron Ahuvia is a professor of marketing at the University of Michigan Dearborn College of Business and the most widely published and cited academic expert on non-interpersonal love, including brand love. He is also a keynote speaker and leading expert on how our happiness is influenced by money and materialism. He has been ranked 22nd in the world for research impact and consumer behavior and ranked in the top 2% of all scientists in the world across all disciplines by an independent study from Stanford University. He studied philosophy at the University of Michigan before getting a PhD in marketing from Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. And I could go on and on, a lot of really great accomplishments, um, but I'm going to pause there, give you a chance to now, Aaron, to share anything else about yourself that you'd like the audience to know about your background, your personal context, and we'll dive on into the conversation. I've been studying brand love for a long time. It so happened I had been studying the psychology of interpersonal love uh, in my PhD program at some depth and got the idea, well, how does that apply to brands and products that people love? Uh, this was in the late 1980s. I'm that old. And it turned out that nobody had actually looked in depth at that. So my work was the first work that really founded the whole area of brand love. And I've kept at it for 30 years, uh, culminating in a book that came out in 2022 called The Things We Love. Mm -hmm. And that's about the psychology, that sort of the fundamental psychology underlying brand love. It also includes people's love of things that aren't brands, people's love of music or nature or what have you. But if yeah. you are interested in brands, uh, it, it covers brands as well. And that, I was very glad Amazon designated that uh, best business book of 2022. And that's sort of the most accessible way uh, people find this conversation interesting, uh, that people can get more information. Yeah, well, that's wonderful. And congratulations on the success of your book and your research and uh, a lot of really great impacts there. And I know you're you're also uh, reaching out and, and speaking and, and sharing this with practitioner audiences around the country and around the world. And that's also uh, fantastic. Now, let's start 
uh, digging in a little bit. And if you can define for us what brand love is exactly, I, I think it, it makes intuitive sense to people as you're talking. Um, but if you can get a little bit more specific about what brand love is, because like you said, it really can apply to a lot of different things. Um, what is it? And then we can get into some of these other components that I mentioned in the introduction. Brand love is simply love. Uh, but we all know that love takes on somewhat different forms depending on what you're loving. So if you're in a romantic relationship, that love is a little bit different from the love you feel towards your children. And both of those are a little bit different from the love you feel towards your car. So brand love is, it isn't just brands, it covers products or services, or if you've got a nonprofit, it would cover marketing your nonprofit, or as you mentioned, you're an employer, you wanna recruit, it would cover branding you as an employer. But any sort of organizational or business context where you want to get people to love something you have on offer, that's what brand love is about. Yeah. And and I guess maybe a little bit about why this is important. So from a branding perspective in a company, why would I want to foster this kind of brand love um, you know, with my consumers or if we're talking about employer branding with my employees, et cetera? This will shock some of your listeners to hear me say this because I've noticed most people who do any sort of consulting will argue that whatever whatever they are interested in is the number one answer for everyone. But that's not true for brand love. Uh, there are many companies like Apple that are making a killing, fabulous money. And they Apple is very conscious of brand love and they study it and they measure it and they're very serious about it. And that's why they are the most loved brand in the world. Uh, but there's other companies like Walmart that are not about brand love and they're making a lot of money too and they're doing very well. So it's not the right strategy for every company. However, if it turns out to be the right strategy for your brand, and we can talk a little bit about how you know whether it is or isn't, then it's super important because people relate to objects in a very kind of non-emotional, matter-of-fact practical, pragmatic way. People, if there's some rock on the street, you're not going to go online and tell your friends how great it is. And if somebody says it's an ugly rock, you're not going to go online to say, it's not ugly, it's great, and defend that brand. Um, and you won't really care much about it. So if you want, if your brand strategy is that people are going to pay a high price premium for your product, and they're going to promote it online because they're just that excited about it. They're going to tell their friends about it and you're going to get a lot of real loyal repeat business for it. If that's your strategy, you need brand love. And if you can't, because the only way to really get that uh, is to get people to start seeing your product a little bit more the way they see people, because those, those emotions and those responses are hardwired into your brain as appropriate for people, not really appropriate for rocks and trees and other stuff that's out there in the world. Yeah. So a lot of companies, um, they don't, they might not use the phrase brand love. They might say, look, we're just trying to get customers really excited about our product and have them like it so much they'll pay a price premium for it. But from a psychological perspective, if you look at what's going on in the brain, what's happening when they succeed is brand love. And and maybe you can help me understand if there's any connection um, to, you know, this term brand tribalism. Um, that's something I've seen a little bit in the marketing space. And when you get into various ideologies, uh, that's a common uh, kind of an approach. Uh, how does that potentially connect to this idea of brand love? So I, I'm thinking of, you know, that, that intense commitment and loyalty of customers to a product, to an ideology, um, you know, that, that drives a lot of behaviors, right? Yeah. Is that something you've looked at? Looked at that in detail for years, and it is absolutely central to brand love. And it is an example of brand love. If anybody, again, they might not themselves use the word love, but if you've got someone who identifies with I'm a Nike person or an Apple person or what have you, a Gucci person, right? Or an organic food person, whatever it is. 
Uh, if someone's identifying in that way with the product or the brand or the category, and they see it in a really positive light, what's happening in their brain is a form of love. It's the same thing that happens when you uh, come to love a person. It's not as strong by any means. It's milder, but it's it's a milder form of the same or very similar psychological processes. Well, and I think about it in terms of like, I, I don't want to get political, um, but as an example, like political ideologies uh, in the United States, Republican, Democrat, like there's an intensity there, <laughs> uh, this this tribalism there, this intensity and people, it's it core to their identity. Um, it is core to their many relationships, their decision making, their behaviors, etc. Now, that's a little bit more of an extreme example than, say, you know, someone who's really committed and devoted to Apple products, though those people exist <laughs> and are really, you know, passionate about it. Um, but yeah, those, the, I mean, that level of intensity um, is gold for organizations that are trying to, you know, continually foster ongoing commitment and relationships with customers, right? Yes. The core mechanism when you fall in love with another person is you can sort of imagine that you open up your identity, your sense of who you are opens up, expands, goes around that other person and sort of like a nice warm hug just sort of brings them in and you come to see that other person as a part of yourself. That's why when you love somebody, it doesn't, you don't have to think a lot about doing what's, what's going to help them. If you have, if something, if you're hungry, you don't have to give yourself a logical argument for why you should eat. It's obvious to you why you should eat. If you love another person and they're hungry, then you'll have the same instantaneous, you know, impulse to feed them that you will for yourself. And the reason you have that impulse is because they, you have at a psychological level come to think of them as an extension or a part of who you are. With that basic process being in place, if there is a brand or an organization or a political identity that you take on and it becomes part of who you are, part of yourself, uh, then that's the same basic psychological mechanism that underlies that. And that's why these tribal identities, you, you talk about people who really love Apple and how that's not so dim, <laughs> not so different. It's really not so different from people who are politically uh, very involved, hopefully, you know, politics, I do think, is a little more serious. Hopefully, we take politics a little bit more seriously than, you know, what kind of cell phone we use. But I'll tell you, I've met people who are so passionate about Apple or about Ford or about whatever it is that they're passionate about that really, they I, you could put them head to head with a lot of political zealots and, and you wouldn't see much difference. Yeah. And, and there's, as you've mentioned, there's a lot of power here because it does drive behaviors. It drives interactions. And I guess that gets in, a little bit into where I wanted to take the conversation now in terms of corporate social responsibility, um, ethics, you know, what responsibility do organizations have to their customers, to their employees when they're fostering this kind of intense brand love Um to, to, you know, create a, an ecosystem, a, a holistic experience, you know, for the consumer um, or for the employee, the, the organizational culture and the employee value proposition, you know, what, what are some of those, those ethical considerations that we need to really be thoughtful about? If you want to keep things with your customers on a, what you might call a strictly business kind of level, where you're not asking them to love you you know, you're just a product, they're just a customer, you still have a lot of ethical obligations to them because I think we have ethical obligations to everyone in the world, but they're a little bit more limited. When you start saying to someone, you should love me, we should, with well, the nature of love, the, the, what it's for, the reason love evolved was to create an alternative to strict exchange relationships. In the family, you know, you don't like say to your kids, 
I could give you this peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but it's going to be two bucks, right? You don't, you, you don't have those sort of strict exchange relationships with the people that you love. In brand love, you do have more commercial kinds of relationships, and that's acceptable because that's kind of the context in which the love occurs. But there's still a sense in which you're asking your consumers to go over and above the call of duty to help your brand. And you should really respond by being willing to go a little over and above the call of duty to help them and to think about what's in their best interest, uh, not to take advantage of every opportunity. I think in the long run, that can be very profitable for businesses, but it can mean passing up some short run opportunities where you could make a little bit more money if you sort of exploited their uh, willingness to trust you. But do you want to do that? I mean, think about what that makes you as, as a human being. It's like saying to someone, getting someone to be your friend just so that you can like take advantage of them in some way. You don't want to do that. Well, yeah, there's clearly a, a human case for these ethical considerations uh, and for CSR you know, uh, initiatives and, and attentiveness within organizations or personally, right? Um, there's a clear human case for it. We can make that argument all day long, but let's also remember there's a clear business case for this too. Like what happens when you exploit and take advantage of employees or you exploit and take advantage of consumers, you might, because of that brand loyalty, because of that brand love, you might be able to get away with it for a while, but what happens eventually if you continue to do that? Uh, it's going to erode trust. It's going to erode that commitment. It's going to erode that loyalty. Uh, and it's, you're going to have serious backfire effects. Oh, and, and they can be a lot worse. I mean, hell hath no fury like a consumer scorned. If mm -hmm. the consumer feels that not only is your product maybe a bad product, but they have been betrayed by you, you can get a lot of anger. And there are consumers, uh, and I don't consider this to be ethical either on the consumer side, but there are consumers, for example, who are furious at certain brands. And they'll go online and they'll pretend they have purchased all kinds of products from the brand that they never purchased just so that they can go and give one-star reviews to every single product from that brand that they can locate. So it can be very punishing uh, if you, you know, create a relationship that goes wrong in that way. And it is something you need to watch out for. You are sort of playing with fire a little bit. That said, there's quite a bit of research showing that brand love, the higher, more love consumers have for a brand, the more long-term uh, return on investment there is and the, the more the stock price is related right. to brand love over the long run. My own work has shown tremendously strong effects of brand love on consumers' willingness to pay a price premium, positive word of mouth, and that includes digital, you know, word of mouth as well as word of mouth. Um, having a sense of loyal relationship with the brand, repurchasing behavior, cross-buying, like all, every good thing you want as a marketer uh, has been shown empirically, scientifically to be very strongly related to brand love. And there was a, a recent paper that I did not write, which is good because it doesn't have sort of my stamp on it, but it was uh, independent uh, academics who looked at the various different causes of brand loyalty and that have been proposed in the scientific literature on this and found that brand love was the single biggest predictor of brand loyalty. So there's a, a very strong tie to profitability. Monetizing digital services since 2004. Boosting the entertainment industry by making digital content accessible for everyone. AWG where innovation meets monetization. If we continue down the track of, of talking about employer branding here for a moment and employee experience, uh, you want to attract and retain the best people. Um, how do you do that? It's largely reputational, right? Um, over time, you become known as a company that is either a great place to work or it's not uh, a place that's a great place for people to launch their careers, grow in their careers, or it's not. And like you said, not every company, just like not every company is going for brand love and their strategy, um, you know, the difference between a Costco and a Walmart, the difference between an Apple and, you know, name whatever other 
tech kind of lower end tech company, whatever. Um, it's the same thing with employer branding. Not every company is striving to be the best place to work or make it on best place to work lists. And not every company, you know, is going to try to uh, aim for the top echelons of talent. Um, they know that they're, they're going to, you know, bring in who they can bring in and hopefully keep them as long as they can, but it's not going to be some exceptional experience. Um, yeah, it, it just depends on the organization. It depends on the strategy. But generally speaking, I think there's pretty clear consensus that stronger employee experience, stronger employee branding is going to benefit organizations, you know, just from a business case perspective, just the ROI of it uh, in the investment of uh, uh, efforts into those initiatives is going to pay off in dividends. And so organizations are paying close attention to this. Um, and if if I'm trying to uh, be an employer of choice, even a just kind of a market, you know, at, at market level, um, like just a good, decent place to work. We're not going to exploit you. are not going to take advantage of you. You're, you can come here. You can develop. You can grow. Um, you know, if, if that's what we're going for, um, keeping in mind this brand love component is really, really important. And you mentioned something just a few minutes ago that I think is really important to reiterate. And that is that the more you lean on this brand love, this, this loyalty, this commitment, the, it is, it can be playing with fire. And it's just like in intense, in, in love relationships, the, the intensity of emotion is higher in love relationships than it is for people you don't care about. <laughs> I, I, I can have intense, um, strong emotions, either positive or negative, that tends to be associated with people that I have, you know, in that I'm in love relationships with. And the same thing when we're talking about organizations, when we're talking about brands. And if you, if people feel duped, if they feel um, that you have not been transparent with them, that you, ha- or even actively have um, not um, fostered the type of trust uh, that they've expected, if they feel exploited, any of those sorts of things, uh, it will hurt you so much more than if you were just, you know, kind of that baseline, we're just going to, we're not a great place to work, but we're a decent place to work kind of a relationship. People know what they're getting when they show up. It's going to make a big difference. Brand love actually has a a nice positive virtuous cycle with employee satisfaction in two ways. Uh, So this is, this has actually been shown empirically in, in studies that when employees are happy on the job, they treat customers better and customers respond to this by coming to love the brand more. Um, it is also true, uh, I explain in my book, how any time a person, a customer, has any interaction with an actual human being from your company, that's going to have an outsized effect on their love for the company or the brand, because love really evolved as a, as a relationship and an emotion that we feel about people. And if there aren't people involved, it's kind of hard to generate brand love. You can do it. And I talk about in the book how to do it, but it's a little harder. So any anytime that you're actually having human to human contact of some kind, that becomes very central to people's sense of love for the brand or the company. So if you've got happy employees, uh, that creates happy customers. And then vice versa, happy customers, A, they treat employees better. No, no employee likes to be you know, ridiculed and criticized by customers. That's not good. And B, if the company has a good reputation, you can imagine a company like you know Tesla or Apple, people are really proud to work there. Uh, because people, you know, customers really value those brands. And when you say I'm an employee at one of these companies, your friends say, "Oh, wow, that's really great." You know, I've heard good things about that. So there's, you know, positive feedback for the customers as well. You can take it one step farther, and if you think about what are now being called uh, mission-driven brands or values-driven brands, there's a, a lot of different terms for this floating around. But the idea is that the brand promise is more than just a good product or service. It's that we're going to be concerned about the ecological environment. We're going to be concerned about social issues. We're going to try and do right in the world. So we're going to give you a really good product, but we're also going to try and be good corporate citizens. And that becomes part of the brand promise. Well, I was speaking a little earlier in the show about what is so central, one of the main central things in brand love is that people come to identify with the brand. They come to feel that it's, you know, part of who they are reflects well on them. 
Oftentimes, this leads people to love luxury brands because they are proud to be associated with Ferrari or what have you because it's you know such a high end brand. But more and more, especially for younger consumers, what they're really proud to associate themselves with are these companies that have a, a larger mission to them that goes beyond just making money. Patagonia is the obvious example that jumps to mind. Lots of people, I'm working on a project now on love of different kinds of clothing and fashion brands, an academic project. Lots of people are talking about how much they love Patagonia. And it's because they've got great products, but they also mean something at an ethical level to these people. They they share their worldview. You you mentioned earlier how about people get these tribal identities with, you know, Democrats or Republicans or these different political ideologies. Well, a brand like Patagonia can really tap into that for a lot of people. So those brands really become part of the consumer's identity. And then there's a positive carryover for the people that work there also, because it's nice to work at a job where you feel that you're not you know, just helping the company make money, but you're actually also doing something worthwhile in the world. So employees want to work at those places. And when they work there, they are motivated and they're willing to put in a little extra effort because they feel that they're participating in a mission that really matters to them. Very well said, Aaron. This has just been a great conversation. I know we've only scratched the surface. There's a whole lot more that could be said on this, uh, but we're going to have to leave it there for today. As we wrap up, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about Mm -hmm. Uh, your work, uh, where they can find your your book, uh, engage with you in, for speaking engagements and such, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. So once again, the book is called The Things We Love, How Our Passions Connect Us and Make Us Who We Are. And you can find it at most bookstores, certainly on any online retailer, uh, book retailer, you'll find it. I also have a website called thethingsweelove.com. And you can find information about the book and you can sign up for my blog with Psychology Today there. Um, It's a great place to get in touch with me. Also, if you want, are you looking for a speaker on any of these or related topics, um, you can contact me through that website. Brand love from a marketing perspective is incredibly powerful. We did not have a chance in this uh, conversation to really get into why it's a better fit for some brands than others. What I would really recommend is as a first step to any company is to think through how you want customers to relate to you and the promises that you want to make to those customers and how to work that out. One of the things I do a lot with clients is sort of walk through that with them and have some conversations about that with them. So I would say that's a first place to start. But if you are able to generate brand love, it is the most powerful marketing initiative out there because love is the most powerful motivator that we have. Yes. Thank you so much, Aaron. It has truly been a pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Aaron can do for you. Check out the book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.